All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna start this waitlisted webinar courtesy of ESM Prep. My name is Josh Davis, and I'm joined here by the lovely Andrea Santoriano. Hi, Andrea. Hello, everybody. Um, so obviously this is a somewhat of a, a bittersweet webinar. Um, <laughs> you know, the landscape right now, universities and admissions, obviously very competitive, very tough. And it means that some very deserving kids might get waitlisted at the end of the regular decision process. Um, waitlisting just means that you hear back from the school, they like your application, but they don't like it enough to admit you, but they also are not rejecting the student and therefore they're placing them on a wait list. So we'll explain kind of the context around all that and share some strategies that maximize the chances of getting in. All right. Uh, in terms of little admin stuff, so there is a chat feature that you may use here as well as potentially a Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, please include them in the chat and we'll try to address them. For the most part, this is a, a general set of guidelines for the wait list. Obviously, every case tends to be very, very different and unique, uh, but these are some general tips that you know a majority of students might be able to use. Um, and Andrea, for context, has worked in admissions for a while. I don't know if Andrea, if you wanna give a quick little intro about your background with admissions. Sure, so I um, started in college admissions a while ago. Um, so I worked uh, traveling for most of the country and then switched to the high school side about 25 years ago. Um, and since then, I've been working in independent schools all around the country doing college counseling specifically. So as you you probably you know get a sense from, from that intro that Andrea knows what she's talking about, and she's seen a number <laughs> of, of waitlist students and have it probably go both ways. And you know, my experience with ESM also, we've had kids get you know, what I would call almost lucky from a number standpoint, getting off the waitlist. Um, so again, it's it's a reason to still be hopeful. So we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Great. So we'll talk about again what it is, how it works. You know, share a couple of numbers and and, and data for context. Uh, some tips on how to approach the current the next steps once you're on the wait list, and also some things to avoid. Um, but for the most part, it's you know how do we even explain the wait list? Why do schools use it, Andrea? It's interesting. So the waitlist has, you know, I think more than one purpose. Um, and colleges individually make choices of how they're going to use it. So colleges understand they can't admit every deserving student. Um, of course, there are lots of students who could do the work many times over and they just don't physically have the space for everyone. So as they're reviewing applications and they decide who they're admitting and who they're de denying, they're also going to hold on to a group of students that they really show interest in. Um, and might want to come back to should space become available. Because what happens from a college is they make offers of admission, but not everybody accepts that offer of admission. And they have lots of formulaic ways of, of estimating what those numbers are, but it's not an exact science. So if a college makes a certain number of admission offers, they anticipate a certain number of those students accepting and a certain number of those students not accepting. So as it gets closer to that, national May 1 deposit deadline, colleges are watching that number very closely and deciding whether or not to go to their wait list to make a few offers because they have a very specific target, right, that they want to enroll. Um, they have so many bed spaces, so many right, uh, lab spaces. They, they have a very set number they have to hit to make their board of directors happy um, and their student and residence life uh, offices happy. So that's sort of the gist of what colleges think about as they're considering the wait list. So, and you know, kind of that fact, that yield factor, right? That you're kind of mentioning yes. the idea that like a school might offer, you know, 2000 spots. And like you said, they're anticipating that a few would say no. Is it, do they, do schools tend to underestimate that? You know what I mean? Like how do you, it's such a- Yes. Predicting, will this kid say yes or no? Yes, like said, excellent. It's not, right? And that's an excellent point because the pandemic created even less predictable yield for it, for most colleges. Almost every college had a challenging time right during the pandemic in determining actual yield. Um, so it's become a strategy of highly selective colleges to actually under enroll or offer fewer spots um, than they know they actually want. So they can then ensure they're going to hit that number by taking exactly the number they need from the wait list. So I have actually seen wait lists become a little more active in the last couple of years because it's become a strategy of some colleges out there trying to nail that number right, right on the head. 
No, even in my experience, let's say in the last 10 years, whereas I had almost no kids get waitlisted, you know, a decade ago, maybe one or two. Now it's almost every kid will at least hear back waitlist from one school, right? And yes. Uh, and when you try to tell them and listen, like whether it's number manipulation or statistical manipulation, the kind of lower acceptance rates, whatever it is, it's the school's yeah. agenda, but it means that yeah. they are making use of these waitlists a little bit. And again, some more than others, right? right. Some more than others. Of and course. We, we can kind of go into that data, but I look at it as a, it's a maybe, right? Yes. It's a maybe. It's you have a chance and you know, the stats might not be that favorable, but also if you look at acceptance rates for most schools, they're also not necessarily like in every <laughs> favor. So it's not too- Exactly. The norm, it, right? It's that old adage of, so there's a chance. Well, right. yes, if you're on the wait list, there is a chance, right? Of course. Um, and I think it's hard for students, right? To figure out, should I put a lot of effort into that chance? Is it a slim chance? Is it, you know, a greater chance? Um, and another thing that's become a little less predictable is when colleges actually go to the wait list, right? So once upon a time, as colleges zeroed in on that May 1st deposit deadline, they had a goal, that date was coming, and they could see, of course, clearly whether they were trending ahead of their right goal or, or behind. And wait lists really came out sort of right around that May 1st, but into sort of later May and early June um, for the most part. But we are already in this current climate seeing colleges using the waitlist, going to the waitlist. I mean, already now on April 10th, um, a host of colleges around the country are already making waitlist offers. That didn't happen three or four or five years ago it, it, to this degree. No, it's it's really, really evolving. And, um, you know, I think we should probably go into now the data, which... yes. For anyone that loves data or analyzing data, good luck with this because you know the conclusions and the trends. It's it's, it's a roller coaster, right? It's literally up yes. and down. You know, we've we've put four California schools here and then in Princeton just for for good measure. But you know, whether whether you get this data from the Common Data Set or yeah. from the school's website or whatever it may be, it yeah. won't be consistent data, right? Year to year. And you, and you mentioned the pandemic as really being an outlier and yes. schools having no real idea, like okay, what do we do now? Yep. Now we've had a couple more cycles of, I would say, a little bit more regular yeah. admissions. Yeah. And still the wait list is a mess. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, but again, one of my main takeaways, again, these are big, big public schools, a couple of small private schools, some elite schools, you know, that there are kids who who get in every single year. Princeton, not last year, but the year before, yeah. So Again, it's 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 very hard for an admissions office to predict, like you said, yes. the exact number of kids who are going to say yes, or which kids from where are going to say yes. Because that's the other part about the wait list. Who actually gets in off the wait list, right? Because right. hundreds of kids or thousands of kids are on it. <laughs> right. Who then gets in? So that's the other thing. Exactly. It's you know, there's so many institutional factors that have to be taken into consideration here that we can't really control. Right. right. Can't can't predict. And even just looking at these numbers, Josh. Um, you know, a student or a parent might be tempted to contact the admissions office and say, you know, how many got in last year? Well, last year's over. It's gone. It won't matter at all to their needs this year. Um, I mean, it's good information to have a sense, particularly if colleges traditionally go or don't go. But you can see here, any given school, it could be a zero, right? So, um, or 150. They just, the institutional needs change year to year. Um, they change within a cycle, right? So um, it's it's any college rep would say it's really challenging for them to give you any helpful information on whether or not they'll go to the wait list and whether or not that will be helpful to your specific situation. Right, because even if you did some kind of math where it's, you know, you could look at the early rates, look at the regular decision rates, see how many, some schools don't even release this data anymore, right? Yeah. But some schools right. might and you bet, oh, okay, like this many kids we think got in. It's like, but you still don't know how many said yes in regular decision, right? <laughs> exactly. We don't exactly. have that data. So you can't be like, oh, we, you can't make the assumption of there will be this many spots left over. Right. Uh, but again, like still a maybe. So yep. use this data as, as you, you know, would with like you know, lottery numbers, for example, right? Like, yes. oh, the yes. <laughs> All right. So exactly. if you are on this, a waitlist spot, you know, the, the kind of what's to do next. So you just say yes, right? Like you kind of take yes. yes if you want to go to the school, if you actually right. want to go to the school and you haven't gotten into another school that you also really, really love. And yep. that's that's the other part about this is like, you know, at this point, 
ideally a student has gotten into at least another, uh, another school where they can put on the deposit and secure a spot and answer the question, am I going to college next year? Yes, you're yes. going to college. What well, might change is where you go to college. Exactly, exactly. And, and I've seen it many times where a student accepts a spot on a wait list, says yes to the college, and then they kind of forget about the waitlist school because they're focusing on the fact that, oh, wait, this school actually wants me. Yes. Right? Like, I yes. should probably show them a little bit more love. Yes. They, they attend an admitted student day or something, and they engage more with the social media of the admitted students. And, and yes, they just sort of let the waitlist float away, right? They, it, I see that happen every year. And if it's a case where it's a school that you, you're like, hey, like, okay, sure, I got in somewhere else, but I really, really want to give it <laughs> my best chance. Um, you know, here, here are some of the tips that we kind of initially have. What are some of the things that you've seen, you yeah. know, can't say it works every time, but maybe. Of course. A good chance. Well, the first um, thing to do, as Josh said earlier, is accept your spot. And even just that process has changed in the last several years. It's now quite common for there to be a place in the student's applicant portal to accept that spot. Um, and you, if you're interested at all, you can change your mind later, but if you're interested at all, you want to accept that spot right away. So say yes, you can always change your mind. Um, and then, you know, obviously there are some tried and true techniques um, to thinking about what active steps can I take to improve my chances, right? What, what, what can I do? And the next thing to do after you accept your spot is to read carefully the directions from that college. Because there are colleges who say, yes, we welcome an additional letter. We, we, please email us, please come to visit, whatever those steps might be. But there are colleges who say, nope, we don't want anything. No more letters, don't email me, we'll email you. Um, maybe your counselor at your school can send an updated grade report. But again, you must read those directions really closely and follow exactly what they tell you to do. You definitely wanna do that. That's, that's the next thing to do. I think from then, though, you want to consider, again, some of those tried and true things. You want to email the representative, right? Encourage um, them to take another look at you, indicate it's your top choice. Um, you might ask the rep, is there something I or my school counselor can do? Can we send you an updated grade? Could we get a senior teacher to offer some comments on my behalf? What, what might the college like to see? So those are some things I think initially to jump on board um, and think about when you're waitlisted. Yeah, it's um, like you said, every school admissions office operates a little bit differently. Some, you know, tend to kind of yep. insulate themselves from, from, from the outside. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, we know everyone wants to go here. We got it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> not to convince yes. us that part. Um, but then others, you know, which we don't think necessarily name, they really want to see that engagement, that, that interest demonstrated. And they want to see, okay, like, has there been growth over these last few months? And I think those yes. are the ones that I kind of respect, right? It's because yep. a lot of kids, when they apply, they'll kind of take a foot off their gas. Yes. Academically yes. Or in terms of extracurriculars. And then yep. some who are just switched on in a different way will actually continue yes. to rise, you know? And yes, yes. Do you know, great things because that's kind of like, they're like, oh, this is the best version of me. I'm now right. almost done with high school, but I, I know who, what I am, what I love, and I was able to yep. accomplish this. And of course, yes. that is an update that the school might appreciate. Exactly. It's sort of come into their own after the, the rush of the early applications, right? They've, they've grown into themselves, so to speak. And I, I encourage students to think about what has changed since the time you applied. Because for some students, you might have applied back in the fall, right? And been deferred and then moved to the waitlist. But if you applied in January, which is the sort of common regular decision timeline, a lot can happen between January and April 10th, right? Or, or May 1st. Um, so definitely think about those things that have taken place. Have you improved in an academic class? Have you really shown some growth? Um, did you win some sort of departmental award? Did you do some amazing thing over spring break, right? That they will have no idea about. These are things that you want to show them how you're continuing on your academic and personal path since the time you applied. And in terms of you know, because again, sometimes there's that letter of continued interest, which you can just like right. type directly into the portal and click submit. Um, yep. Sometimes it might be a PDF that you upload. Sometimes it might right. be an actual email, right? So the formatting yes. is a little bit different. Do you, do you think it, is it, you know, an advantage? So if a school says, hey, tell us, 
Should yep. you do multiple things? Is that? Yes, yes, right. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, if they've opened up the door, then you want to do multiple things. Now, we'll get to the on the slide where things not to do, which we'll talk about this, but you want to, of course, email the regional representative for your hometown area, right? Um, you definitely want to do that. And whether you're giving them an update academically, personally, you definitely want to indicate if they're your top choice school. Um, those are some key immediate things. And you want to do that fairly quickly, right into the waitlist time zone. Um, if you're getting, let's say, an additional recommendation letter from a senior year teacher or somebody who has worked closely with you that the college hasn't already heard from, right? So don't, don't use your track coach if they've already heard from your track coach, or don't use your English teacher if they've already heard from your English teacher. But if you did a, a spring break trip um, with a mentor, you know, have that person write up a paragraph. They don't have to be the same length and detail as the initial recommendation letters, but more of a character reference, right, at this point. Um, so I think you want to email the rep. You want to see about securing an additional letter. Um, you may want to do some online digging, right, of that particular college, attend um, some sort of uh, virtual program that they're offering so you can follow up in a couple weeks and talk about what you did to demonstrate that interest, right? I, I know I'm on the wait list, but I continue to investigate the chemistry department because my dream is to major in this and I really love the research that's available to freshmen with professor, you know, so-and-so. These are key things you wanna keep doing strategically over the course of the waitlist period. Um, I think there's a line, right, of demonstrating interest and then being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like you said, it's, it's almost, if, especially, I always tell kids if you're very honest, right, because if you're at this point and you've gotten somewhere else and you don't see wanna go to the school, you know, maybe you don't, have to, you don't have to tell them, hey, I got into so-and-so, but I still want you. That's that's right. almost like telling, you know, someone that you're dating, hey, I, you know, this person asked me out, yes. I'm <laughs> yes. not going to work out for you. But yes. like you said, almost approaching it as like a mini supplement, yes. right? Within the email or within the letter of like, yes. you know, it's like, you, it's your last chance too, essentially. Right, you know, right. You kind of have nothing to lose. So it's like, hey, all my cards are now on the table. Yes. And also... Like you said, I really, really want to do this course. I really want to, you know, get yes. all this program. And I just can't get that anywhere else. And that makes right. me, I'd, I'd almost feel like, you know, like I'm laying myself down if I'd only at least go for it a try. And absolutely, so again, there's also, like you said, the line between desperation. Yes, yes. Right? And, and that's the key, right? That's the key. Right. Yeah, so I actually, I would say, Josh, to students, it is like a love letter. Like, and to be clear, like you said, I'm putting all my cards on the table. Say that. Say, I'm literally, I'm putting all my cards on the table. Here's what I know about your school and why it's a good fit for me. Because, um, right, you're at the end. This is your last gasp and put it all out there. Then you never worry right. later down the road, could I have done more? Could I have said more? Every rock has been turned over. You've given it your all. Exactly. All right. In terms of what not to do. Ah, yes. These are my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> so number one, number one. Do not, I know they mean well, I am a parent, we mean well. Do not let your parent or guardian do the email or make the phone call to the college. That is an absolute red flag problem. Um, colleges don't want to hear from them. They want to hear from you, the applicant. So if you want assistance in planning to make that call or planning to write that email, ask for help. Your parent, your school counselor, a trusted teacher or an advisor, Go to someone in, to help you with the wording, but do not let a parent do this for you. I promise you it will backfire. Yeah, that's honestly at this point in your life, that's probably advice for everything else moving forward, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it just has to come from the source themselves. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're, you're, the school expects to be dealing with adults, you know, yes. young adults did that, but still, yep. you know, they're the one <laughs> they're opening up the doors of campus to you, right? You're going to be living there. So yeah, that's great advice. And then the part where we, you know, respond with the proper tone. Yep. That, you know, again, it's, you know, I always say that with kids like, oh, you know, I, I'm disappointed I wasn't accepted or uh, I'm not, you know, kind of like, well, mm -hmm. you gotta be careful, right? You gotta be careful. It's, 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 yes. it's, it's struck by way, right? It's, it's still appreciating that you're on the wait list, that you're under consideration and that you understand yes. how hard their job is, you know, a little yes. bit. Things like that, right? 
a hundred percent true. Like I, I know how hard your job is. I know how difficult it is to get in. I'm so appreciative. I had this opportunity to provide additional information and hope that you have the time to give my file, you know, another look like that's, that's the tone. It's not the, I can't believe this happened or poor me, right? They, they want, they want to know they're admitting young adults who can navigate tough roads. Um, so yes, proper tone is definitely also a must. And then the, the don't overdo it part. So, <laughs> you know, I think back in the day, you used to hear these stories about like, I went to the office every day yeah. until they hired me and I yes. made sure I bought them coffee every, you know, yes. we're not, we're not promoting that anymore. That's no. not that, that's not the right, right idea. No. For, for sure. And you know, you don't want to email a representative daily, weekly, that's right, too much. Um, you may be tempted to do something such as send the admission officer something, flowers, cookies. Um, this, this is not helpful. I know it feels like it should be helpful, um, but it's really not helpful. So follow the basic guidelines, put your best foot forward, and you just have to trust the process. Um, if you overdo it, that that's problematic, I think, for the admissions committee on the other on the other side of this. Exactly. Um, and again, like those, the instructions that they detail in their waitlist letter, you know, you, we can't explain, you know, talk about that enough, right? Like you have to kind of follow those because sometimes it's just, can you follow instructions? It's yep. that simple. Can you follow instructions? So yes. Um, so true. It is that simple. Follow directions. Okay. And then we kind of talked about this a little bit, right? Yeah. As far as the other school and accepting, you know, your spot at another school, paying the, the deposit before May 1st, um, and still creating a sense of excitement around the idea of going somewhere. And again, this can be tough, right? That yeah. to get psychologically prepared to go to a school. And then let's say you do get off the wait list in June. Yeah. And now the decision, you know, the ball's back in your court. And yeah. you're like, oh, but I, I was already kind of halfway there. I know. Yes. <laughs> this yes. Other school. You got to be prepared for that, right? I think that's important to kind of discuss with your parents. And remember also, at that point, maybe it might not be the right fit for you anymore. You know, even if you get off the wait list, and you shouldn't feel bad, I think, about that, right? If you get off the wait right. list, and then you say no to them, yeah. it's maybe not the most ideal, and I get it. There's the consideration of like, oh, my high school, like, you know, all that do, but right. you have to go where you fit, you feel is the right choice for you, so. A hundred percent true. You know, uh, students are so... Um, kind-hearted about this, that you're right, they feel badly about turning them down. And I will tell you, colleges, they welcome both answers, yes or no, because if it's no, they can quickly move on to another person who does actually want to be there. So please don't feel badly if you have done some self-reflection and you've really thought about this and you've invested, right, your energy over here and now you're in love with that school. Um, please don't feel badly about letting that that weightless college down if they do make the offer. They're happy uh, to, to move on, really. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, we put down here, you know, filling out the housing questionnaire. Yes. You know, like yes. the medical forms and it starts to feel very real. Yes. And then you remember like this school wanted me. It's wanted me for a while. And, you know, you might even get, you know, access to these resources and the course catalog. And like you mentioned, the, the social networks and the different kind of engagement with the other incoming students. Yep. All of a sudden you're part of that community already. And yes. And you know, the peripheries of the other one, it's, you know, Again, it's, it makes this process tough, right? Because we, we're literally talking about kids who submitted some schools in late September, early October, and yep. we're going to be in May, June, still kind of figuring we, out places. It's so true. Yeah. I have found, Josh, that to be one of the biggest changes over the course of my career, but in, in recent years in particular, is that social media connecting incoming students, right? It, you're right. They're already forming housing friends and class friends and and it's fascinating to me to see the students like talking about where that who they're chatting with at their college already before the school year is even out um and filling out as you said housing surveys and orientation surveys before the senior year is even over so you you do become you can become very invested in that school um early right away all right, so those are kind of the main tips. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you had any others that you felt like families or parents, students needed to hear. Um, the, only, the only other piece I would suggest is um, if you're waitlisted, obviously you're engaging, you're picking a college by May 1 and you're engaging with that college, do, doing all the things you need to do to enroll, right? Planning on that. Um, but if financial aid is part of your process 
and you are on a wait list, that's actually a conversation that you might want to have um, with a college representative or somebody in that college's financial aid office is what, what are the situations around um, financial aid availability if I'm taken from the wait list in June? Um, what might that look like? Because that might be an important uh, component for students out there. Yeah, that's a great, great point. It's actually something that's happening with one of our students right now yeah. uh, in California, where she got into her number two school. Yeah. She got waitlisted from her number one school. Oh. And then obviously there's a financial aid piece, right? So it's, it's yes. Um, you know, again, this is part of, of, of the process is, is, is kind of understanding the full landscape of what's ahead of you and like, okay, like you got to make moves, right? You got to make moves. So, um, so were there true. any questions from any of the attendees at the moment? Please feel free. Yep. Uh, we'll give you another kind of 30 seconds or so. You can put them down here in the chat. Um, but if not, we'll just assume that we were able to kind of answer people's you know, curiosities mm -hmm. and of course, wish nothing but luck and success to anyone that's dealing with the wait list right now. Um, okay. I have seen a kid off the wait list like June 20th. I think that was like oh. the latest uh, from, from a school in Boston. I'll just put it that yes. way. Yes. He actually went to the school. That's oh, the wow. He went to the school. So wow. it's hard for me to shut the door. That's two months away from now. That's in, it's oh. ridiculous. I know. That's, that's a long wait. That's a long wait for a waiting list. Yeah, it's, it's almost too long. Um, yeah. But anyway, thank you so much for all those who are able to watch. Anyone who's watching the recording now, we appreciate you tuning in. Andrea, thank you for your time and your expertise. Thank you, thank you so much. Everyone have a great rest of your day and springtime. Bye. Take care. Thank you.